Gracious Heavenly Father, for those in need of a miracle today, we, we come and ask for your help. We believe that you're mighty over every storm. We believe there's no wind or wave that can pull you under. And yet, Father, we feel small in the storms of our lives and feel like the waves are too big and the wind is, is too strong. Would you please, Heavenly Father, today work a miracle, miracle in this room, miracle in our hearts, in our families, a miracle in the lives of any person watching online. We ask you, Father, we don't have anywhere else to go, but we ask you because you've told us to. We need to ask you also that uh, you would be kind and forgiving toward our speaker because his sins are so abundant. And help us to see Christ today, only Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all who agreed with the prayer said, Andres Lopez thought he could ride out the hurricane in his fishing boat. It was September the 12th, 2017, and Hurricane Irma was bearing down on the Florida coast. She had already wreaked havoc throughout the Caribbean displaying winds at a sustained speed of 180 miles per hour. And now she threatened to do the same to Miami. Lopez heard the warnings. Still, he believed that he and his 25-foot fishing boat could survive. He just didn't want to abandon ship. His beloved boat called Run Running was more than a recreational vehicle. It was his home Lopez wasn't a, a polished member of the, of the Yacht Society. He was an equivalent of a sea squatter, a person who lived on board and made his living by selling fish and, and cleaning boats. His 56 years had left their mark. He had lost most of his hearing, lost nearly all of his teeth, and he didn't want to lose his boat. So as the waves began to roar, his craft began to bounce, and his cabin spun like the interior of a washing machine. Still, he hunkered down, hoping to survive, but then the sky turned as black as a raven's wing, and lightning began to pop. He climbed up on the deck, and he surveyed his options, and then he knew he really only had one decision. He dived into Biscayne Bay, and he flailed. He swam like crazy for a hundred yards until he was on a sandbar and that gave him enough time to catch his breath and spit out some salt water and then here comes a, a tidal surge and it lifted him up and carried him 200 yards and dumped him in a city park, his back up against the backstop of a baseball diamond. Rescues found, rescuers found him sometime later, scraped and scratched and and soaked to the bone, but he was alive. And in a, in a television interview, he, he said, you've seen that movie, The Perfect Storm? <laughs> well, this was my personal disaster movie. Have you had one of your own? At some time or another, most of us can, maybe all of us, we have our own form of a disaster movie. The sky just seems to upend a bucket of troubles and the wind blows and the waves are too high. We can't see out of them. We're lifted up and then plunged into the trough of the next. And we wonder, we really wonder if we're going to drown. The disciples wondered. We're, we're looking at the miracles of Jesus in the, as recorded in the Gospel of John. And this one this week takes us to the Sea of Galilee. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into the boat and they set off across for Lake Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. And then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. 
This little story outlines itself. If you like to follow on your outline, let's begin with this. Storms come with life. Storms come with life. Wouldn't you agree that storms are an apt metaphor for those monumental challenges we occasionally face in life? And what the disciples felt that night on the Sea of Galilee is something similar to what you felt that night in the emergency room or that day in the cemetery or those hours after you heard the words from the doctor or the first time somebody explained to you what it meant to be bankrupt. Maybe you felt what the disciples, disciples felt Uh, They felt their hearts begin to sink as they were sure their boat would. They searched the sky for a break in the clouds. They, They gripped the boat for fear of the waves. They screamed their prayers for help to come. And maybe you've done the same and heard what they heard, and that is no response. If only Jesus had been with them in the boat, or if only Jesus had not commanded them to cross the lake, but Jesus was not in the boat, And they were on the lake because he commanded them to cross over to the other side. And consequently, this moment has all the elements, all the components of a perfect storm. The sky was dark, or as Scripture says, it was dark. And Christ was nowhere to be seen, or as Scripture says, Jesus had not yet joined them. The wind was strong and the waves were high, or as Scripture says, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. How many of you think they were exhausted? Don't you know they were? They had rowed about three or four miles. It would exhaust most of us to do that on a calm day. A boat can, I'm told, cover about 30, uh, cover a mile about every 30 minutes when the water is calm and the winds are are not blowing against you, but waves and winds. They'd been fighting the storm for hours. They're, they're early in the morning. It's close to 3 a.m. They've been rowing. They began at sunset. So they've been rowing for nine hours. This was no happy trip on the Guadalupe River in an inner tube. It was a back-breaking, bone-bouncing, terror-stirring, push-and-pull of the oars. Don't you know that more than once one shouted out over the sound of the storm, I don't think I'm going to make it. This boat's about to go under. Here's how Matthew described this moment in his gospel. They were in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. (laughs) They were too far from the shore, too long in the struggle too small in the waves, and Jesus was nowhere to be seen. I'm wondering, can you remember such a dangerous, dark, seemingly God-forsaken season in your life? Too far from the shore. No solution in sight. Too long in the struggle. Too long in the court system. Too long in the doctor's office. Too long without a good friend. Too lonely, too long. And too small against the waves. The the, the storm controlled the disciples. Sometimes storms come into our world and we just don't have any control over them. We cannot control the economy. We cannot control the weather. We'd like the marriage to get better, but we only have one vote and it requires two. We'd like the relationship with our children to improve, but we cannot force their hearts to change. Storms can command us, and sometimes it seems those storms will never end. But we love this story because it reminds us that even though storms come with life, Christ comes in the midst of the storm. They saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. Do you ever think the Bible is just a little too short of descriptors? Don't you wish John had paused here and unpacked what he saw? We want to say, John, before you hurry on to the next sentence, we've never seen anyone walk on water. What did you see? Was the hair of Christ blown back? Was he walking on the water? Maybe was he ankle deep in it? Was he glowing in the dark? Was his robe soaked? 
but we don't get anything except this economical phrase, they saw Jesus walking on the water. I guess that's all we're supposed to know. And maybe, maybe that's all we need to know. And that is Jesus is Lord over nature and that he is Lord over every storm. And there are occasions in which he stills the storms and then comes. But there are also occasions in which he comes in the midst of the storm before he stills it. Christ comes in the storm. He comes walking in the midst of the storm. And he says to us what he said to them. It is I. Don't be afraid. It is I, don't be afraid. In the simplest of the Greek language here, it would be translated, I am, don't be afraid. I am, don't be afraid. Rather than tell the disciples what to expect, he tells them who he is. If God had a calling card, you know what it would say on it? I am. This is the name God gave himself. Who remembers when God gave himself this name? With Moses, correct? Remember the bush that didn't burn up? And God identified himself as I am. Tell them I am sent you. God says I am. That's his name. If you were to come up to me and I start off by saying I am, you'd be waiting on me to finish the sentence. I am Max, I am tired, I am happy, I am hungry, I'm sleepy. We have to describe because we're always changing. But God says, I am, because he never changes. He never vacillates. He's never up and down. He's never tired. He's never energized. He's always the same. He is steady. And in those situations in which we wonder if Christ is coming, Christ gives us his name, I am and in those moments in which we wonder, does God care about me? Will he come to help me? He says, I am. Which we think, is God aware? Is he near? His answer comes in the form of his name. What's his name, church? Would you let God speak his name over your life right now? Would you let him speak his name? His steady, unchanging, strong name. Those of you who are dealing with aging parents, those of you who are in the middle of job changes, those of you whose body is behaving in a way you've never imagined it would, would you allow God to speak a word of steadiness over you just by saying his name? I am. Would you receive in your heart the promise that is yours to cherish? Isaiah 43, God says, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name, you're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. I am God, your personal God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, so don't be afraid. I'm with you. Isaiah chapter 43. How many needed to hear that promise today? We'd rather be spared the storm, would we not? I mean, if there's going to be a cancer, let it just be a mole on the skin. If there's going to be a job layoff, let me receive a paid vacation and then a better job at another location. If there's going to be marital strife, let it end with romance. And many times it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And in those moments in which we feel like we've been rowing all night and our arms are sore and the waves are high, God comes to us in the midst of the storm and before he delivers us from the storm, he appears inside the storm and he says, it is I. It is I. In fact, I think that's the big takeaway of this message, of this miracle, and that is Christ uses the storm to teach us about himself. He uses the storm to teach us about himself. Do you think the apostles remembered this storm event for the rest of their lives? 
Boy, I do. Can you imagine any time in which the memory of the storm might have proven helpful for them? How about when Peter was thrown into prison? How about when John was isolated on the island of Patmos? How about when the disciples were scattered over the then known world, going into countries they had never seen, trying to speak languages they had never studied, under the threat of persecution? Do you think they recalled this moment? in which Christ came to them in the midst of the storm and they gave themselves this self-assurance, he came then, he'll come again. Might he be doing the same with you right now? Might he be instilling within your memory bank an experience, an experience of Christ coming to you in the midst of a difficult time because he knows that more difficulty lies ahead. And he wants you to be able to recall, to remember, to look back and to say, you know, this is a tough time, but God got me through this before. How many of you have already done that? Is there a time in which you look back over your life and say, you know what, that that experience back in middle school, I didn't think I was going to (laughs) survive, but I did. I didn't think I was going to get through it back when I was 21, but I did. I didn't think I was going to make it there in my early 30s, but I did. And God instills in our memory banks these experiences that are truly more profound than anything we can read in a book. So that not only do we have courage, we also have courage to share. Might it be that God is equipping you with with a challenging moment because he knows someday your children will have a similar moment and he wants you mom and dad to be able to say oh honey let me tell you about when that happened to me but let me tell you how God is faithful have you already had that happen in your life where you have a personal testimony that you can give where God brings you face to face with somebody who is facing now what you faced then might it be that the purpose of this challenge is just to give you a story to share about how God got you through it. The psalmist came to a similar conclusion. In Psalm 119, in verse 71, he said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. How many times do you visit somebody in the hospital and they say, It's good for me that I'm in the hospital? How many times do you visit somebody in the unemployment line? They say, oh, it is so good for me that I've been laid off. Rarely do we hear somebody say something like this. But what if we could? What if we could come to an understanding like the psalmist did and say, you know, it's not easy. It's not pleasant. But I believe that a good God is in heaven. And consequently, it is good for me that I may learn your statutes In other words, that I may learn more of your way, learn more of your heart. And rather than resist this difficult season, I will embrace it. That God has enrolled me in the University of Hard Knocks. Anybody paying tuition right now in the University of Hard Knocks? Oh, you'd love to graduate, wouldn't you? Well, you will in time. In the meantime, it's good to study And ask the question, Lord, what is it that you're trying to teach me? You see, difficulty is the soil into which God places the seeds of faith. Difficulty is the soil into which God places the seeds of faith. Do you want faith tomorrow? Well, then heed this time of difficulty today. I was on a phone call some time back with a friend of mine who was telling me about his son who had been diagnosed for cancer at the age of seven. That led to seven years of chemotherapy and treatment. But today that that young boy is, is healthy, he's playing football. But what struck me about the story was the way that cancer was discovered. Uh, the youngster was seven years of age when he was roughhousing with his cousins and, and one of the cousins kicked him in the stomach 
Well, that hurts any time. But this, this created a, a, an acute pain so severe that mom and dad uh, took their boy to the emergency room and al an alert physician noticed something and, and he called for some tests. And the tests uh, led to the discovery of a tumor behind the boy's spleen. The, the tumor was removed and when the doctor uh, had a chance to visit with mom and dad after the surgery, the, the dad asked, how long has that tumor been there? And the doctor said, well, there was really no way of knowing. But I could guess, judging from the size of the tumor, that it's only been in there for three or four days. And the father, my friend, said, you know, Max, God used a kick in the gut to get our attention. You know, God uses a kick in the gut, doesn't he? Oh, wouldn't we prefer the miracles in which suddenly food appears out of the basket that Jesus has, or, or suddenly that water becomes wine. Wouldn't we prefer those miracles? But every so often there's this, oh, this kick in the gut in which God gets our attention. And so my question to you today, those of you who are passing through stormy times, can you say what the psalmist said? It is good for me. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Would you be open to a miracle of this sort? Would you be open? You see, when we're passing through stormy times, we are sitting ducks for a sour spirit. When we're passing through stormy times, we are sitting ducks for a sour spirit. We can be like that little girl who was sitting outside the cabin at the summer camp. The camp counselor found her crying, and he said, honey, are, are you homesick? She said, no, I'm here sick. <laughs> we can develop a case of here sickness, and we're just sick of being here. Well, don't, don't give in to that. Don't give in to that sour spirit. Don't give in to that, that attitude of ingratitude. Rather, be open to a miracle. Be open to the possibility that God is using this to equip you, to prepare you, to give you what you need today because he knows of the challenges you're going to face tomorrow. Just this week, I signed a, a, a letter of recommendation for one of our, our young members, David Mara, is 24 years old, an outstanding young man, applying for medical school. He's volunteered at Santa Rosa Hospital for 2,000 hours. He just spent five months in his native Romania volunteering with, uh, with orphans and, and, the, and, and, and people in poverty. He went to college on a golf scholarship. He's really a model, model young man. But to hear his story, he would tell you that it all began with a tragedy. It all began with a kick in the gut. He was only six years of age when he was incorrectly treated in Romania for an upper respiratory infection. He suffered penicillin-induced penicillin anaphylactic shock, and he nearly died. That's when his parents uh, kicked into gear and they did everything they could to, to save their son. They ended up in the United States at the Children's Hospital of Chicago. It was there that David not only found his health, but he also found the early semblance of a call. As he says, to this day, I remember the security I felt in the care of health professionals, and I want to provide the same for others. Could it be? Could it be that that kick in the gut will be used by God to create a fine physician that will bring care and kindness to others? And it all began with a storm. Could it be this storm you're passing through is a time for you to appreciate the storm, to listen in the storm, and to learn in the storm, and to say like the psalmist, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn of your statutes. Be open to a miracle. And, this is important, be a part of this miracle. What is God wanting you to learn? Rather than shutting down and closing your ears, open your ears and stand up and say, okay, Lord, I'm listening. You got my attention. What are you trying to show me? Are you trying to teach me about your character? 
Are you trying to display your ability? Are you wanting to develop my faith? What are you trying to show me? You know, the disciples learned that when Jesus gets in the boat, everything changes. I love this, this statement from a commentary written by Matthew Henry well over a hundred years ago. Regarding this verse, he wrote, Though the night be dark and the wind high, we may comfort ourselves with this. We shall be at the shore shortly and are nearer to it than we think. You see, this is what the disciples learned. They learned that once Jesus got into the boat, everything changed. Remember the way the story ends? So they gladly took him, in, gladly took him aboard, and at once the boat reached the shore they were making far for. You know, your part and my part is simply this. Invite Jesus into the boat. Invite Jesus into the boat. Don't give in to short-term solutions for long-term problems. Don't try to drink this away, spin this away. Don't take it out on everybody that you see. Just ask Jesus, Jesus, come into this problem. Come into this struggle with me. It could very well be that the presence of Christ in the boat will change everything and you will experience what the disciples experienced. I mean, you'll be at the shore before you have time to wipe the rain off your face. But then again, it may take some time. But what we do know is this, this storm will not last forever. And when Jesus is in the boat with you, everything changes. Yes, keep rowing, keep bailing, keep doing your part. But realize that you don't have what it takes, but Christ does. Make sure you invite him into the boat. Will you do that? Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this story that tells us how you come in the storms. For Father, there are many in this storm, and we ask that you help us as we, as we wait on your presence. Through Christ we pray.